In this video, I'm going to continue looking at the Python data model, focusing on collections. So I'm just going to activate my spider environment and launch spider. So recall previously that we discussed that everything in Python is an object and is based on the design pattern of an object. And if we have a look at the directory of an object, we get the following identifiers. And from the previous videos, you should be more or less familiar with what all of these data model identifiers do. Let's also have a look at the directory of the string class. So if we rearrange these identifiers, we can see that it's consistent to the object directory, i.e. it's based on the object. And it also has some additional identifiers that are collection based. So the string is essentially a sequence or where the fundamental unit in the sequence is a Unicode character. So if we press Windows and full stop, we can look through the emoji panel and we can have a look at all the symbols and each of these symbols is an emoji character. We also had a look at the bytes class and the bytes class was a sequence of bytes and was also text related. So we've seen a high level of consistency between the directory of the bytes class and the, the string class. Recall a byte is an integer from zero to 256. Let's now have a look at a tuple. Now the fundamental unit in a tuple sequence is essentially a reference to a Python object. And if we have a look at the directory of the tuple, we can once again see the design pattern is based upon an object. And we also see a high level of consistency with the string class. And this is because they're both sequences and follow the design pattern of a sequence. So I'm going to assign five object instances to the labels A, B, C, D, and E. I notice when I do so that these display on the variable explorer. And if I type in the object name in IPython console, then I'm essentially given the printout of the formal string representation. And in this case, it tells you where the object is saved in memory. So if I want to see these five objects at the same time, then I can separate them out using a comma. And what's returned to the console is essentially a tuple. So you can see that these um, parentheses are added to the end. So we can explicitly um, specify the tuple using the parentheses. And as you can see, the default representation includes the parentheses. Notice that if we just type in comma after an object, then we actually get a single element tuple. So let's just assign this to the object name, single element archive. And we can view this in the variable explorer. So notice that we click into this and then we view the tuple itself. And the tuple is a reference to an object. So notice that the tuple has a numeric index. And this is because the data model method get item is defined. And this means we can index into the tuple using square brackets. So if we index into the only element, zero, um, we retrieve the object. So essentially this object has two labels. One is the um, single element archive at index zero. And the other is the object name A. So we can see that these two are equivalent to each other because they both reference the same object. And recall, we can delete a label, but this doesn't delete the object. And in this case, we can reference the object using its other label. Now, a tuple is immutable, which means once it's created, it cannot be modified. So we can't go in and delete a reference. So essentially we don't have the data model method set item and delete item. However, we can delete the, the entire tuple and this will delete the other reference to the object 
and now all references to this object are deleted so the object's orphaned and it's cleaned up by Python's garbage collection. Recall in Python that the parenthesis is used to change the order of precedence of an operation. So if we wrap around the object B in parenthesis, notice that the return value is just the object B. So we've just emphasized this operation and we've just evaluated expression down to the object B. Now if we have a comma after this object B, notice that we return instead a tuple. So you can think of this comma as essentially meaning that a reference to this object is going to be made within this tuple. So let's create a tuple um, with the object name archive. And this is going to make references to the objects that we see in the variable explorer. And we're actually going to make duplicate references. And let's have a look at the return value of this tuple. And here we can see the locations in memory. So we can see what object is what. So recall that archive at index zero is essentially a label. And if we have a look at the label B, we can see that these point to the same object. And if we have a look at the label archive at index one, we can see that this points to the same object as the label C. And if we assign the string hello world to the label text and have a look at text at index zero, we get the letter capital H. Text at index one, we get the um, letter um, lowercase e. Text at index two, we get the letter small l. And if we have a look at text at minus one, we get the last value, which is the exclamation mark. So we can get the last reference in archive by typing in archive at index minus one. Notice that if we do the length of archive, we get eight. But if you have a look at archive in the variable explorer, you see it's got index zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we count up to eight, but don't include eight itself. So the last value is eight minus one. And recall that we can index into text using a slice. So we go from zero to three, but we don't include three and we get capital H-E-L, which is a substring. We can also do the same in archives. So we go from index 0, 1, 2 up to 3, but don't include 3. So we get these three objects returned as a tuple. So recall that the data model method contains defines the behavior of the in operator. So let me just assign the letter L to the variable letter, and I can see is letter in text and this is true. Now I can actually assign hello to a substring and I can see is the substring in text and I can see that this is true as well. And in the archive I can see is an object in the archive and so if I check if b is in the archive I get true. So the count method will count the number of times a substring appears in a string or in the case of the tuple, it will count the amount of times an object appears in the tuple. So the count of B is four times, so this tuple makes four references to this object. And we also have the method index, which will retrieve the index of the first occurrence of this object. So if we have a look at the index of letter, which is L, we can see that we get the index two. And to find our occurrences, we can use the optional parameter start and end to limit the, the search range. So for example, if we want to find this last L, then we know it's somewhere in this last letter. So this is um, between index six and the last index, which is minus one. So we've got analogous behavior in the tuple, so we can find the index of the reference B. So we can see that its first occurrence is at index zero, and we could restrict the range in order to find one of the other occurrences. So a sequence is iterable, which means it can be cast into an iterator. 
So let's have a look at text first and cast it into an iterator. So every character in text is an ASCII character. So we're going to get a string ASCII iterator. And when we call next on it, we see the, the current letter and then we advance. And we can create an iterator from archive. And essentially we, we advance through the references. So we've got a reference to an object and then we advance and then we've got the reference to the next object and, and so on. And recall this is essentially the mechanics for a for loop. So we can have a look at for letter in text and print the letter. For the archive, we can think of this as for reference in archive and then print the reference. So notice that the syntax is similar because there is consistency between the data model identifiers. So I explicitly use the object class. However, typically the tuple would contain instances of other object types. So for example, we can have A, which is a string, B, which is a string, C, which is a bytes instance, D, which is a byte array, E, which is an integer, F, which is a boolean, and G, which is a float. So we can create a tuple using all of these values. And if we view this tuple in the um, Fairbow Explorer, we can see that each index now has a type and a size and a value. So tuples are often constructed over multiple lines um, where, where convenient. So for example, in this case, it doesn't really make much sense to construct a tuple over multiple lines because the um, references um, being made are essentially one character object names. So everything fits on a single line. However, if these were long um, object names, then it would be much more readable um, constructing the tuple over multiple lines. So let me just give an example of that. So previously we've essentially assigned each instance to a separate object name and viewed this on the variable explorer and then constructed the tuple. So now let me just construct the instance text and instead of assigning each of the objects separately to um, object name and then um, using these object names within the tuple, we can just construct the instances within the tuple. So you can think of this as seven separate assignment statements that are essentially going to be grouped into the collection known as archive and therefore each index corresponds to, the, to its following object. Now that we've got a tuple of mixed data types, let's have a look at using n again. So we've seen that we can check to see if the substring e is in text. Notice that if we look for the substring e in archive, we get false. And this is because the data model in archive is looking for a complete reference to an object. So basically the ID of the object hello does not match the ID of the object e. And therefore, if we search for E in archive, we're going to get false. But if we search for hello in archive, we'll get true. So we're looking for a reference to a complete object here at a specific index of the tuple. In both cases, the data model method multiplication allows multiplication by an integer to replicate the collection. The reverse multiplication operator is also uh, assigned, so this means that you can times the collection by an integer as well and essentially get the same result. Let me just instantiate another instance of the string class and also another instance of the tuple class. So now that we've got these two other instances, we can have a look at the data model method add which defines the behavior of the add operator. So it essentially allows concatenation of two strings or concatenation of two tuples. So the data model method um, getItem means that we can index 
into a collection to retrieve the object at a specific index. Now we don't have set item, so this means that we can't assign it to a new value. And we can't do this because the tuple is immutable. So that means once it's created, it cannot be modified. So we don't have set item and we don't have delete item. And notice that in all the data model methods we used, that the tuple was essentially left unmodified in the variable explorer. And instead we had a return value. Now, although the tuple itself is immutable, it can contain references to mutable objects. So if we have a look at archive at index three, we return this byte array. And we can have a look at the object ID of this byte array. And recall that archive three is essentially an object name to this byte array. So what this means is that we can select this byte array using this label and then we can index into this byte array. So this will be using the byte arrays method get item now. And the byte array is mutable, so we can assign this to, to another byte. So if we have a look at this byte array now, we can see that it's been updated. So we've changed essentially this E to an F. And if we have a look at the formal representation of the tuple, we can see that it appears to have changed as well. But recall that the tuple itself is essentially a sequence of references. So if we have a look at the ID of archive at index three, we can see that it's still in the same object ID. So what this means is the label still points to the same object, i.e. the same location in memory. And so the tuple itself hasn't changed, but one of the values being referenced um, has changed. So if we try and use hash on this tuple because it has um, the value that is mutable, we get this type error, unhashable type by array. If we instantiate a tuple, um, only of immutable values, then everything being referenced by the tuple as well as the tuple itself is immutable. So we get a hash value. For the tuple, the formal and informal string representation are pretty much identical. And you can see that this tuple has strings with escape characters um, and they're just shown directly instead of the escape characters being processed. Recall the output in the IPython console is essentially the printed formal representation of the tuple. And this is the recommended way to instantiate a tuple. So a tuple also has the comparison operators defined. So these essentially work element by element. So one would be compared to one, two would be compared to two, and then three would be compared to four. So the tuple supports different data types as well. So we can also um, compare the values of strings and recall that strings um, each have Unicode characters and each Unicode character has an ordinal value. So this is essentially what is being compared under the hood. If you have mixed data types, um, you're going to get this type error because you're essentially going to be trying to compare two data types that can't be compared with one another. However, a, a tuple with an element at the end um, can be compared with a tuple that doesn't have an element at the end. And the longer tuple is going to be greater than the shorter tuple. The return value in a function is quite often grouped together using a tuple. So for example, if we have a look at the function devmod, we get them tuple of two integers from the integer division and the modulus respectively. So let's just create our own function that performs the same behavior. So it's going to take in the numbers, number one and number two, and then we're going to get div, which is going to be from the integer division. And then we're going to get mod, which is going to be the modulus. 
and what we want to do is return um, both dev and mod so this is done using the return statement now normally we don't put the parenthesis around the tuple um, for, for readability purposes however what is being returned is a tuple and recall when we first looked at the tuple we seen that we can instantiate it with parenthesis or without using parenthesis and essentially when we don't use the parenthesis we are just instructing to use Python's default sequence and its default sequence um, to, to group objects is a tuple so that's why the behavior without the um, parenthesis works so if we call this function we get a tuple returned if we assign it to a variable the tuple is assigned to the variable typically we wouldn't use the tuple in this way we would just unpack it um, and we would unpack it to a tuple of variables and once again we typically wouldn't put the parenthesis around um, this tuple just for readability purposes so notice in these use cases that the tuple itself is typically not used it's just used for convenience to group object names together to return them from a function and then to assign um, these return values to new object names so because the um, sequence that's being used is just being used for a temporary purpose and it's not going to be modified then it's much more convenient to use a tuple that's immutable um, compared to a sequence such as a list which is mutable and has a higher memory overhead notice when we use the delete statement to delete multiple variables that we actually group the variables together using a tuple and this is normally done implicitly so we wouldn't add the parenthesis we can assign multiple variables using a tuple so we can set x, y to equal 1 and 2 and we can actually swap the variables x and y using a tuple so once again let's delete x and y and we do this using a tuple however normally we don't have the parenthesis around the tuple because recall that the tuple is essentially Python's default sequence for grouping references together so recall when we had a look at text data types that we had um, a mutable byte class and we had its counterpart which was mutable the byte array class so recall immutable means that once the instance is instantiated it cannot be modified so when something's immutable all its methods um, have a return value and the instance the method is being called from is unmodified so the mutable class has all these immutable methods but it also has mutable methods which modify the instance in place and have no return value typically and the immutable tuple has the mutable counterpart which is the list so the list has um, consistent immutable identifiers to the tuple but it has the following mutable identifiers at the bottom and notice that some of these are consistent to the ones shown in the byte array and this is because the byte array and the list are both based upon the design pattern of a mutable sequence okay so in a fresh console I'm going to create the variable archive which is going to be a tuple and I'm just going to create this over multiple lines and recall that this is immutable so if we open this up in the variable explorer we'll notice that all its fields are grayed out and this is essentially because everything in it is read only so if I cast this to a list that notice that essentially the only difference um, and its instantiation is that square brackets are used opposed to parenthesis so we can construct this over multiple lines and if we view this in the variable explorer notice that all the fields are colored now and this is because we can interact with it 
So think of archive as a tuple as being read only and active as essentially being an active archive where we can go in and modify and change things. Now you can modify things using the general user interface of the spider ID. However, what this does is it um, essentially carries out reassignment. So notice that when we reassign something, we get a new object ID. So we're not using a mutable method. We are just reassigning um, the object name to a completely new object. So you see if I go in and modify something and um, refresh the changes, that it's a new object as well. And we can see this by having a look at the object ID. So we can see that we've got a new object ID and this means that this is a new object. So we've essentially reassigned the, the old object name to a new object. So this shouldn't be confused with a mutable method which mutates an instance in place. So if we have a look at the data model identifier, get item, we can use this to index into the list to retrieve a value at a specific index. So we see this works with both archive and with active, which are a tuple and a list um, respectively because these are immutable methods. The mutable method set item allows for reassignment. Now this isn't um, defined in the tuple class, so you're going to get a type error if you attempt to use it. And you can use it in the list class. So let's have a look at the ID of active at index zero. And then we're going to reassign this to a new object. So notice that the ID of active zero changes. However, the ID of active doesn't change. So the list is still the same object, but the list, which is essentially a sequence of references, um, one of the references now points to a new object. So there's a super subtle difference here, um, but it's fundamental. So you're using the list mutable method set item um, to set the item to a new item and the item that's being set to a new item that's being reassigned. So it's important to know what object's being reassigned and what object is essentially being mutated in place. So let's create an empty tuple and an empty list. So in the variable explorers, we see that these have the size of zero. And we see the values are essentially the empty square brackets and the empty parenthesis respectively. Recall that to create a single element tuple, we need to use the comma because otherwise the parenthesis are taken to denote the order of operation. And therefore you're just going to get the single element out with a tuple. For a list, we can use square brackets just with the single element um, because it's not confused with another operation. Okay, so I'm going to delete the object names that I no longer want, such as not a single element archives, single element archive and single element active. And recall that this grouping of object names to be deleted is grouped together essentially as a tuple. So if we have a look at the hash value of a tuple, we can see that if it contains a uh, immutable data type, that it's unhashable. However, if it doesn't, then it is hashable. A list is always going to be unhashable because a list itself is mutable. So the list has consistent counterparts to all the immutable methods we've seen in the tuple. So we can use get index. Um, to get an index or slice, we can use the um, keyword in because we've got the data model method contains. We can use length because we've got the data model method length. So this is going to give the number of references in the mutable list. 
We've got count, which is going to count the number of times our reference occurs in the mutable list. We've got index, which is going to retrieve the index of a specific reference. We've got the multiplication data model method defined, which means we can use the multiplication operator with an integer to perform replication. And we've got the addition data model method defined, which means we can use the addition operator to perform concatenation. And the list also has mutable methods that aren't available in the tuple class. So if I open up empty active and perform this in place addition, notice that instead of having a return value, that empty active is mutated in place. So we also have the method append, which can be used to append a single reference to the end of the list. So if we refresh the list now, we can see that we've got index seven and it's a reference to the string hello. Now we can append any object to the end of a list. So this object can be a list itself. I notice that when we double click into this, we view the list that is at this specific index. We can also extend the list um, from another sequence. So notice the difference in behavior between append and extend. So append will append the sequence to a single index and extend will extend a list um, by the number of values present in the, in the sequence. Insert can be used to insert a value at a specific index. So notice that the reference to this list active is at this specific index. So notice if we have a look at the ID of empty active two and empty active nine that they're the same and this is the same as the ID of active. So we can check is active in empty active, and this is true. And if we count the number of times active is in empty active, it's two. And we could also get the index of these using index. So we've seen that multiple references are made to this same object active. And if we select one of these references, so for instance, if we select empty active at index two, and then use the list method reverse, notice what happens to um, active itself, it's reversed. And if we refresh empty active, then notice that it's reversed at index two and also at index nine. And this is because these are all references to the same list. Now we can create a copy of this list using the copy method. And now if we go and select one of the references to active. So for example, if we select empty active at index nine, and reverse this, notice that active is reversed and the two, the two occurrences in empty active are reversed, but the copy is left unmodified. And this is because the copy is now a separate object ID to active. And a reference can be removed from a list using the remove method. So once again, this will not affect the copy of active however, will affect active and you'll notice the changes in the two references to active at empty active index two and index nine. And the clear methods can be used to essentially remove all references in active, leaving active as an empty list. So notice you'll see the changes in empty active at reference two and reference nine. And the copy of active is unmodified. 
So I'm going to use the append method to append some numeric values. So for example, 5, 3, 1, 1, 10, and 15. And now this is a list consisting of only numeric values which can be compared with one another. So I can use the list method sort to sort the list in place from lowest to highest values. And the built-ins function max and min can be used to retrieve the maximum and minimum value in this list. The method pop is somewhat unique um, given that it both returns a value and mutates the list. So it pops a value off the list, returning the pop value and the list is mutated in place. So we can assign this popped value to return value and we can also specify an index if we want. Both the tuple and the list support references to the same object multiple times. And Python has another collection called the set, which will only allow unique references. So we can cast this active into a set. And notice that now one only appears one time. So notice that this set is in closed in braces. And we can have a look at the directory of set to see its identifiers. So like everything else in Python, the set's object base. So it's got the object base data model. Notice that there's also some consistency between the set and the list. But then there's some differences um, because the set has unique behavior compared to the list. So a set is a collection, but not a sequence. And this means it doesn't have an order. And notice that the set doesn't have get item. So this is because the set doesn't have an um, index to get the item from. And if we view a set in the variable explorer, notice that we have no index. And therefore, if we try and access an element in the set, um, we're told that the set is not scriptable. So a collection has a length, so we've got five items in this set and it's got contained so we can see whether an item is in the set. And we can also create an iterator from the, the set. And then we can use next on this iterator to view the value and advance. Okay, so let's just start afresh and let's instantiate a set using a list. So this list is going to have repeating values, but when it's cast into a set, we're only going to see the unique values. So the length of this list is going to be greater than the, the length of the set. So if we think of this as a list, in fact, if we just have a look at this list, we can see that B is at index three and index four. So casting from a list to a set and maintaining an index doesn't make sense because you don't know what B um, index you would take. Would you take index three or index four because it occurs multiple times? And therefore the set has no index and is classified as unordered. Now, because the set has the data model method iter, we can create an iterator and therefore we can create a for loop. So for unique reference in unique, um, print the reference. And generally you see the numbers are printed first and then the letters are just randomly shown afterwards. But in general, the set should be conceptualized as being unordered. So let's just um, clear the console and create a number of set instances. So we've got unique one, unique two, unique three, and unique four. And a number of identifiers are set up um, for the concept of a superset and a subset. So a superset will contain all the values of a subset. 
So we can use the method is superset to see is unique one a superset of, for example, unique two. And we can see it is, and we can check if it's a superset of unique three. And it's not because unique three has nine and unique one doesn't. The comparison operator greater than is essentially carries out the same check. So unique one is greater than unique two because it's a superset. We've got the method is subset, which will essentially check whether one set is a subset of a superset. So we can type in unique two and we can see if it's a subset of unique one. And we can see that it is. And we can see that unique three is not a subset of unique one. So this defines the behavior of the less than operator. So unique two is less than unique one and unique three is not less than unique one. When a set contains all the items in another set and nothing else, then it's both a superset and a subset. And the two sets are said to be equal to one another. So the is equal to operator checks for this condition. And so less than or equal to will check to see if the set on the left is a subset of the set on the right or is it equal to the subset on the right. And greater than or equal to will check to see if the set on the left is a superset of the set on the right or equal to it. The method is disjoint will check to see if two sets are disjoint, i.e. sets that don't have any uh, common values. So we can see that unique one and unique four are disjoint. Unique three and unique one, which have some common values, are not disjoint. I'm just going to create another two instances, unique five and unique six. And I'm going to have a look at some of the other methods. So we can perform the union between two sets. And that's essentially take all the values that exist between the two sets. So the values essentially going to be in the set on the left or on the set on the right. We can take the difference between two sets, i.e. the values that are going to be in the set on the left that aren't in the set on the right. And we can take the intersection between two sets. That's essentially the values that exist in the set on the left and on the set on the right. And we can also take the um, symmetric difference. And this is essentially the values that occur exclusively in the set on the left or exclusively on the set on the right. And so we've got the OR operator, the subtraction operator, the AND operator, and the exclusive OR operator also carry out these operations. So we've got mutable equ equivalents of all of the above. So instead of having union update, we just have update because this is the default update. So if we update um, unique five with unique six, we're going to have all the unique values that were in unique five or unique six. So let me just get back to the original values of unique five and unique six. And I can use the exclusive or operator instead. So here you see that unique fives updated in place um, with the union of unique five and unique six. So let's just get back to the original values of unique five and unique six and have a look at difference update. So now we see only the values in unique five that weren't present in unique six. So going back to the original values of unique five and unique six, we can use the um, subtraction equals to operator instead um, to perform the same operation. Going back to the original values of unique five and unique six, we can have a look at the intersection update. So we can see that unique five is now updated to show only the values that intersected between unique five and unique six. And we can also use the and equals to operator to carry out the same operation. Going back to the original values of unique five and unique six, we can have a look at the symmetric difference update. And now we see that unique five is updated to have 
only the values that were exclusively in Unix 5 or Unix 6. So we can return back to the original values of Unix 5 or Unix 6 and use the um, exclusive or equals to operator instead. And once again, we get the same values. So I can just return back to the original values of Unix 5 and Unix 6. So the method add is used to add a single element to a set. So think of it as similar to the list method append, um, but the set is unordered, so it doesn't have a start and an end. So you're just adding a single element. Notice that it isn't dunder add. So it does not control the behavior of the addition operator. And this is undefined in a set, so cannot be used with a set. Remove will remove a single element from a set. Notice that if the element doesn't exist, you're going to get a key error. So there's also the method discard, which will discard an element if it exists and do nothing if it doesn't exist in the set. And the method clear will clear all elements from a set. The method pop recall is unique, um, given that it's a mutable method that has a return value. So recall that the set's unordered, so pop's just going to pop off a random value and return it. So in this case, it popped off the element zero, and in the next case, it popped off the element one. So the set does have a immutable counterpart called the frozen set. So it's not as commonly used. And if we have a look at its identifiers, then we'll essentially see that they're the immutable um, identifiers that we've seen in the set. So you already essentially know how to use a frozen set because you've learned how to use a set. The main difference is in the instantiation um, because you essentially have to explicitly use the frozen set class and then cast a set to a frozen set. Also, Spider at this moment in time doesn't support the frozen set fully in the Variable Explorer, so you're just going to see this as a frozen set object. You should be a bit careful when trying to construct an empty set because if you just use an empty set of braces, you're actually going to get a dictionary instead of a set. So in order to get by this, um, you need to use the set class. So now we're going to have a look at the dictionary. And if we have a look at its directory, we can once again see that it's based on a Python object. And we can also see some consistency with some of the identifiers we've seen in a list. So if we go back to the documentation, we see that a dictionary is a mutable mapping, so it has the following identifiers. So a mapping maps one object in the form of a key to another object in the form of a value. So let's create a list of five keys and a list of five values. So the keys are normally strings, but they can be other immutable objects. And the values are any Python object. So we can zip these together using the zip function. And we can cast this zip object to a dictionary. So notice the similarity between a dictionary and a set. So you've got the same um, set of braces, um, enclosing the collection, and then you've got a comma separating one item from the other. The important thing to note in the dictionary is that you've got the colon, which separates the key from the value it's being mapped to. So let's just assign this to the variable mapping and we can view this in the variable explorer. So notice that instead of a numeric index, we've got the keys and then each value is the object. So you can see that the right end of this dictionary looks like values and we can just see that the left end 
of this looks like keys. Now, an important thing to note is that the dictionary remembers its insertion order, so that the keys should be listed using the insertion order. The Verbo Explorer in Spider, when you expand the view, will actually list the keys alphabetically. Now, because these keys are the letters A, B, C, D, and E, um, this matches the insertion order. But um, Spider will reorder the keys alphabetically, which may not be the desired behavior. So there's a number of collections that you can return from a dictionary. So you've got keys, which is essentially a list of the keys. Values, which is essentially a list of values. And items, which is essentially a list of items, where each item is a tuple um, that's of two elements. The first element is the key, and the second element is the value. Now, the collections returned are their own uh, data type, dictionary keys, dictionary values, and dictionary items. But these can be cast into a list if desired. So notice that the form of items is similar to the form you get when you enumerate another collection, such as a string. So if you take the list of this enumeration, you've got two element tuple, where the first value is the index and the second value is the letter. So the data model method length will return the length of the collection. And in this case, it's going to tell you the number of items in the dictionary, which in this case is five. The data model method get item means we can index into the dictionary. And instead of using a numeric index, which we don't have, we use the key. And we retrieve the value that this key maps to. The dictionary is mutable, so we've also got set items, so we can essentially reassign this key to a new object. Notice if we try and access a key that doesn't exist, we get this key error. So this is similar to the name error when you look for an object that doesn't exist. However, we can instantiate a new object and assign it to a new key using set item. So this will um, update the dictionary in place. And if we select the refresh button, we'll see the new key X now. The dictionary has the data model method delete item, so we can use this to delete a item from the dictionary. So you've seen that when we use get item uh, for a key that doesn't exist, we get a key error. We also have the dictionary method get, which can be used to safely retrieve a key. So if the key doesn't exist, you're going to return none. And if the key does exist, you're going to return the value corresponding to the key. The dictionary is uh, iterable and can be cast into an iterator. And this will display essentially one key at a time. And because the dictionary is ordered by its insertion order, it can also be reversed. So reverse can be used to get the reverse iterator, and if we use next through this, then we're going to go in the opposite order. Now, as the iterator corresponds to key, if we type in for key and mapping, we're going to print the key. And if we wanted the value, well, we can use the key to retrieve the value. So we get the following form. Now, because we've got the other collections, we can explicitly set keys or explicitly set values. Remember, items is essentially a list of tuples. So the tuple has the key and the value. And we can use items to explicitly get the key and the value. So sometimes items is preferred just for readability purposes. However, it is more common to loop using the dictionary, which loops by the keys, and the keys can be used to retrieve the value. So if I just create a second mapping, mapping to, and I'm going to have the keys X, Y, and Z in it. And if I have a look at mapping or mapping to, 
I get a dictionary re return which has all the keys of mapping and then all the keys of mapping to. So notice that the insertion order of the keys of mapping is maintained and then any new keys in mapping to that aren't present in mapping one are below these. And if mapping and mapping to have duplicate keys, then the value in mapping is essentially replaced by its equivalent value in mapping to. The or equal to operator will mutate um, mapping in place, performing this update. There is also the update method, which essentially carries out the same behavior as the or equal to operator. So if we use mapping.update, we can use it to update the values of existing keys. So for example, the key A, B, and C, we can update to new objects, or we can also add existing items, which will be essentially extended at the end of, of mapping once the update is applied. So I'm just going to update the keys A, B, and C in this case. And notice when I have a look at mapping that now A, B, and C are now different objects to what they were before because these three keys have been assigned to new values. So we've seen that we can use get to get a key. And if the key exists, we're going to retrieve the value. And if the key doesn't exist, we're going to retrieve nothing, so we'll return none. There is also the method set default, which will once again um, get a value if it exists. However, if this value doesn't exist, it's going to return the value that we tell it to. The method set default will attempt to retrieve a value similar to get if it exists. However, if it doesn't exist, it's going to create it and assign it the default value and also return the default value. So in line 48, I had the default value as none, so I didn't get an output. But if I had that as a different value, this would be returned. And if you have a look in the variable explorer, you can see that W has the value none type object. As mentioned before, the variable explorer in spider will sort the keys out alphabetically. However, the item with the key W should be at the end of this dictionary because the dictionary has an insertion order. Um, however, as mentioned, spider isn't updated to display the dictionary's insertion order. The dictionary also has the method pop, which can be used to pop off a value corresponding to the supplied key. Notice that this is a mutable method, so it removes this item from the dictionary. There is also the method pop item, which is going to remove the last item inserted into the dictionary. Now, as mentioned, the last item inserted was the item with the key W and the value none. Um, but Spider doesn't display the insertion order, so that's why this was displayed alphabetically instead of having the W at the end. The class method from keys is an alternative constructor that essentially constructs a dictionary from an iterable such as a tuple or a list. In this example, I'm going to use the list A, B, C, D, and E, and I'm going to have the default value as an empty string. If I select this again, I can change the default value to zero. So this can be quite useful if you have a dictionary of only numeric values and then use something like a for loop to populate it. So you can have mapping nums key plus equal the num and then you can increase num by one. So when you run this for loop and now refresh, 
the, the dictionary, you can see that the values have been updated. And similarly, when you're using an empty string, this allows you essentially to carry out a string operation on every single one of the values. So another for loop can, for example, be set up to perform string concatenation of the value and then reassignment of this value to the key. So if we run this for loop, we'll now see the changes. So the keys in a dictionary can be thought of as variable names. And normally they're set up in a certain way um, using strings um, that are easy for a user to remember. So for example, if we have a look at this dictionary, CSS for colors, we can see that the keys are all colors that are very easy for us to visualize as humans. However, the values are in hexadecimal, which is easy to visualize for a computer. So we map something that's easy for us to understand to a value that's easy for the computer to understand. So that's essentially what a dictionary or a mapping does. Now the dictionary um, has the comparison operators here, but they are basically set up in the same way as an object. So you'll see if two dictionaries are equal to each other or not equal to each other. There's no other supported um, comparison operators. Although I mentioned that the keys in a dictionary are normally strings that are easy to remember, sometimes they can be other immutable data types such as a tuple. So in some cases, it might be more relevant to, to use a tuple of specific fields. For example, first name, second name, and the name of a test. And you can see how this dictionary looks like when you view it in the Variable Explorer. And because the keys are tuples, we can just use these keys as normal to index into the dictionary to retrieve the value corresponding to that tuple. So far, we've explored the commonly used collections in built-ins. These are supplemented by the collections module. So if we have a look at the directory of identifiers in the collections module, we have this data model identifier all. And notice it gives a list of strings similar to the output from the directory function. So you'll notice that a lot of the identifiers in directory begin with a single underscore. And this essentially means they are for internal use only. All essentially shows the identifiers that are intended to be used by the end user. And if I just change the variable explorer settings to include the callables and modules, and I type in from collections, import star, this star imports all and all is defined in this data model all. So you see that essentially everything in this list of strings is imported and can be viewed in the Variable Explorer. So if I create a date tuple of the following format, you might misread this depending if you're in the UK or in the US because we use different date uh, formats. So the UK uses day, day, month, month, year, year, year and the US uses month, month, day, day, year, year, year. Now, if we use a dictionary instead, we can name the parameters. And so we can create a number of dates. So we've got the instance day one, the instance day two, and let's just change the month. Notice that if we use the dictionary, um, we don't need to be consistent with the key names. So if we just use D, M and Y, or if we just do D and, and M, then we're missing either some data or we're not using the correct key names. So what we can do is we can create a name tuple. 
So from collections, we're going to import name tuple, and we're going to use this name tuple factory function to create our third party um, date tuple class. And because this is a third party class, we need to use Pascal case capitalization. So to the name tuple factory function, we should also pass through the, um, the class name in Pascal case. And in this case, it's going to be in the form of a string. And then we want to pass through a list of the field names. So in this case, it's going to be day, month, and then year. And then we can optionally set the default values for each field using the parameter defaults and using a tuple of the default values. So notice when we type in date tuple with open parenthesis now that we've got the three field names. So this is the expected data that we need to provide to create an instance of the state tuple class. If we have a look at the directory of the state tuple class, notice that most of the identifiers are consistent to that of a tuple. So there's only a few more additional identifiers and many of these identifiers are the field names that we just created. So let me just reorder the identifiers. And we can see that they're essentially identical to those that we see in the tuple. And that's because the named tuple is a tuple. It's just a tuple with additional information in it. So that means everything that we've seen that we can use in a tuple, we can use in a named tuple. So the named tuple, in this case, the date tuple is a subclass of a tuple. And now instead of being confused between the US and the UK format, when you um, instantiate an instance of the state tuple, you know what to name the fields and you know what order the, the fields are in. So we can explicitly input the names of the fields such as day, month and year. Or we can not provide them and use the default values. Or we can only provide some of them using the named parameters. And if we are providing all the parameters, we can provide them positionally. And we can see the doc string as we input the values so we know what order to put them in. So these five instances display on the Variable Explorer. Now, unfortunately, at present, the um, name tuple isn't fully supported in the Variable Explorer. So you're not going to see the formal representation as the value in the collapse view. And when you actually view the name tuples using the Variable Explorer, it just displays it as a tuple. So you're not going to see the field names in the expanded view. Typing in the full name in the IPython console um, displays the formal representation. And here you can see how to instantiate an instance of the date tuple class. The additional identifiers added to the name tuple that aren't present in a tuple or aren't field names are distinguished um, using a leading underscore. So we've got fields, which gives the field names in the form of a tuple. Film defaults, which gives the fields assigned to their default value in the form of a dictionary. We've got the method asdict, which will cast the name tuple into a dictionary. And we've got the alternative constructor make, which is a class method that can be used to create a new instance of, in this case, the date tuple using a tuple um, with the required number of fields. And then we've got the, the method replace, which can be used to create a date tuple from the existing date tuple, replacing the field names of some of the fields and assigning them to a different value.
Let's now have a look at DEQ, which is a double-ended queue. And if we have a look at the directory of the double-ended queue, we see it's very similar to that of a list. So when we view a list um, from left to right, most of the operations on the list um, operate at the end, which is the right. So you've got extend, append, and pop. Now in a double-ended queue, you've got essentially left variants of these, which operate on the, on the left-hand side or the front. So let's create the following list called active, and let's cast active into a, a DQ. So DQ also has a maximum length. Unfortunately, the Variable Explorer in Spider doesn't yet support a, a DQ. So in order to view it, we're going to need to use the formal representation in the IPython console. So essentially we can append A, and if we have a look at A appended on the DQ, it's appended to the right. We can also append left, capital A, and notice on the DQ that this is now at the front. So let's append left B as well. And now notice that the maximum length has been reached. So when we append left C, notice that this small a has been ejected. And if we append small case a to the right, the uppercase c on the left has been ejected. So now let's have a look at extending um, to the right by using the list b, c, and d. And we can see b, c, and d are added and uh, one a and b were ejected. Let's now extend left A, B, and C. And now notice that the A's here, the B's here, the C's there, and the B, C, and D were ejected. So if we use pop, we're going to take the last value from the right. If we use pop left, we're going to take the first value on the left. And the uh, DQ is mutated in place. We can also rotate it by one. So essentially it means this value is walked off and then joined at the front. If we rotate it by two, then essentially these last two values have walked off and then they've joined at the front. We can also rotate by minus two, which means these two values at the front have walked off and joined at the end. Now the collections module also contains the ordered dictionary class. Now, initially in Python, the original dictionary was unordered and behaved similar to a set. However, the ordered dictionary was in the collections module. Um, the behavior of the ordered dictionary was more desirable, so the standard um, dictionary um, essentially got updated to behave in, in a similar manner. So the identifiers for the ordered dictionary are essentially identical to those of the standard dictionary um, because the standard dictionary is now um, based upon the ordered dictionary. So this separate class um, pretty much only exists for some backwards compatibility so old code can be run in a current version of Python. So essentially the existing dictionary um, maintains the insertion order. Unfortunately, the variable explorer and spider still works in the, the old way and um, orders the dictionary using the key. And this is order is important when it comes to um, applications such as looping through the keys of the dictionary, for example. So generally the ordered dictionary would be constructed um, using the following form. And the variable explorer in spider just um, displays it in the same manner as, as a standard dictionary. Notice that in the past it was constructed using a list of tuples and this is because the, the list order was uh, essentially maintained. 
so index 0, index 1, index 2, and so on. As mentioned, this is no longer really necessary because the dictionary is, is now ordered. So spider displays both a dictionary and an ordered dictionary in the same way um, and doesn't maintain their insertion order. So this is a bit of a bug and hopefully it's going to be addressed in a future version of spider. Okay, so there's another type of dictionary called a default dictionary. So if we have a look at the directory of the default dictionary, we can see that it's very similar to the directory of a normal dictionary. One important thing to note is that it's got this data model method missing. And this data model method missing essentially um, is an instruction um, what to do when you've got a, a missing key i.e. what value to return for that missing key. So let's create a default dictionary. So we need a default factory, which is an instruction to carry out if we don't have the specific key. So this will generate the value. So if we just input string, then the value that's generated is going to be an empty string. And then we can just instantiate it as if it's a normal dictionary. So if we view this in a variable explorer, we've got the, the three colors, red, green, and blue. And if we access red, green, and blue, we get the three colors. Notice if we try and access the color black, we get this empty string. So what's happened is we've called the string class and we've got this empty string. And because we know it's going to be an empty string, then we can use a string method such as concatenation. And therefore we know we can perform concatenation plus reassignment. Now if we compare the behavior to just a standard dictionary. So if we go to the standard dictionary um, with the same data, we can index using the key red, um, but if we try and index using the key black, we get this key error. So let's have a look at another default dictionary. And instead of string, we're going to input list. And now notice that each key value pair has a value that is a list. So we can index into the default dictionary using the existing keys red, green, and blue, and this will return the, the list corresponding to each of these keys. So we can have a look at the key red, the key green, and the key blue. If we have a look at the key black, we get this empty list. And because this is an empty list, we can use the list method extend. So having the, the default mapping uh, return a value that's of a specific class is useful because we can use the methods of that class because we know the key is going to return a value that's the instance of that class. Let's now have a look at a case where we want to return a specific value. So to do that, we're going to construct a, a function. So re recall that a function has a general form define the function name, and then we've got the input values, and then we've got the return statement. What I'm going to do is collapse this down onto a single line. And to do so, we can use the, the keyword lambda. So function name is assigned to lambda, and then we specify the input arguments, and then we use a colon, and then we specify the return value. Now, a lambda expressions is often anonymous, so we don't actually need the function name because we call and declare it on the same line. And if we don't want any input values, we can simplify the expression to the following. So basically, I'm going to use this form in a default dictionary now. So default mapping three, 
is default dict and the default factory expression is going to be lambda and it's just going to return a list with three zeros in it and then we can just use the same mapping as before so that's not the mapping that I'm, I'm meant to use let me just um, re reassign this Okay, so now we've got default mapping three, and we can access the keys red, green, and blue. And uh, notice when we access black and white that we have this default value. And of course, this is a list, so we can access all the list methods if, if we want. So let's go and clear white, and then just extend it um, by the list 111. So apart from this default behavior, the default dictionary behaves consistently to the standard dictionary and can be used um, in its place for most applications. Let's have a look at the text hello world. And supposing we want to count the number of times um, each character appears, we can create a set from it. And then we can use the dictionary class method from keys to create a dictionary um, of these keys with an initial value of zero. Then we can use a for loop to go through each letter in text. So each value in this dictionary is a decimal integer. And in the collections module, we have a collection called a counter, which is essentially an easier way of implementing the, the above and has some additional optimizations. So if we have a look at its identifiers, we can see that the identifiers are essentially the same as that of the dictionary. However, there are some additions such as missing and a lot of numeric data model methods. And this is because we know that the value in each case is going to be a number. And if the number is missing, it's going to be the number zero. So we can essentially carry out all the above using a single line. And if we view this counter in the variable explorer, it displays as a dictionary. We can see the formal representation of the counter um, using the IPython console. And in this case, we can see that each key is a Unicode character and each value is an integer, i.e. the number of counts that this specific character had. And we can also supply other iterables to this counter class. So in this case, we are going to create a tuple of, of objects. And when we cast this to a counter, we're going to count the occurrences of these objects within the original tuple. So in this case, for convenience, we're just going to have a tuple of strings. And if we count this, then we should get the key red, the key blue, and the key green, and we should get the values three, two, and one respectively. And if we already know the values, then we can supply them in the form of a dictionary to the counter. So this will cast a dictionary into a counter. This assumes that all the values in the dictionary are integers. And then if we use the alternative form of creating a dictionary, so using name parameters, we could supply this dictionary to the counter class and we can instantiate the counter class using the same form. So if we have a look at frequency two, we've got the, the method most common, which is essentially going to give you the, the number of occurrences that occur from most common to least common. So this is essentially a reordered version of items by the, the maximum integer count. Total is going to give you the sum of the integers. And because this was created by casting the string, hello world, to a counter, it's going to be the length of the string, which is 12 characters. 
The method subtract can be used to subtract one counter from another counter. So notice that this is a mutable method and mutates the counter instance in place. So now some of the values are zero. So we can have a look at the positive and the negative version of the counter. So the positive is just going to show all the positive values above zero. And the negative is going to just show all the negative values below zero. And the sign is, is not going to be shown. So if we subtract hello again, then we've got some negative values. So if we have a look at the positive, we just see the values above zero. And if we have a look at the negative, we see the values that are below zero, um, but we don't see, see their sign. So we've got the binary data model methods, addition and subtract. So we can perform addition and subtraction using the addition and, and subtraction operators. Notice that in both cases, only the positive values are returned. We can also use the in-place addition and in-place subtraction. The data model method AND is also defined. So here we can see what values occur in the left instance and on the right instance. So for an instance, if we've got L of 3, W of 4, X of 5, then we can see that only W occurs once. In, in both these counters. Let me change this to exclamation mark of three. So that's got two exclamation marks in the left. So that's why we're returning two exclamation marks. And we've got the mutable counterpart in Poissant. Missing is also defined. So let's have a look at a key that doesn't exist, such as X and notice that its value is zero. And this is because a counter is always going to have an integer value. So if we don't know what it is, we're just going to assume that it's zero. And this means that we can use integer um, methods on this. And in this case, we're going to add three to the integer of zero and then reassign it to the value. So this is going to be the value three. Elements essentially creates an iterator of the counter. So you can call next on this to view each value one at a time. Or you could cast this into a tuple to see all the remaining values. Let's now have a look at the chain map class. So if we have a look at its directory, we can see that its identifiers are very similar to that of a dictionary. So a chain map essentially chains multiple dictionaries together. So a chain map essentially chains multiple dictionaries to together and the primary dictionary being worked on is called the, the child dictionary and the other dictionaries are called the parents. So if we create this dictionary default settings and this can be the default settings for a user or some user application. So let's just have text color, font, uh, font size, and let's just create user settings. So we've got font, and now let's create a chain map from both of these dictionaries. So basically we want to use the default settings except when the user has updated their own settings. So in other words, the child dictionary is going to be user settings, and the parent dictionary is going to be default settings. So we can assign this to configuration. And if we just have a look at this using a for loop and print the key and value, we can see that we've essentially got all the default settings except where the user has updated them with um, their own custom settings. So if we have a look at maps, we'll see the, the maps that the, the chain map is constructed from. And if we have a look at parents, then we will see the, the parent map, which in this case is going to be the default settings.
And if we go back to configuration.maps, we see that the, the child mapping is essentially the one at index zero, and the, the parents are essentially at index one onwards. So this is, is, is essentially equivalent. So we can use the chain map essentially as a dictionary. So if we um, go into this key border width, which doesn't exist, and assign it to the value 5, notice that user settings has been updated. And this is because this is the, the child map. So any modifications made to the chain map will update the, the child map. And if we go into user settings and add a new setting, and now have a look at the keys and values in, in, in configuration, then we'll see that this new setting has been applied to the chain map. So the collections module also has the user string, the user list and the user dictionary classes. And the purpose of these is for subclassing. So if we just have a look at user string, for example, and we have a look at its method resolution order, we can see the design pattern of this user string. And we can do the same for user list and user dictionary. So we see a design pattern similar to what we discussed earlier. So let's use user string and we're going to create a new text instance. So we can't use the shorthand instantiation, we need to use the user string class. And notice that this variable text has all the methods defined in the string class. So this can be conceptualized as a subclass of the string class, so we can access anything from the string class in this um, class user string. Now, its main purpose is for subclassing, so we can create this class custom string which is based on user string and in the above we use the methods lo lower and center so let's just um, create our own method center and lower and so we've got this instance self and we can call this method lower from it and we can also call this method center from it So we just want to return this value. And now we've got our own custom subclass. And we can instantiate a new instance. And now we can call our custom method center and lower. So I'm not going to cover subclassing in any more detail in this video. Um, I just want to mention the fact that you can use the custom string, the custom list and the custom dictionary um, to create your own version of these subclasses and you can modify the behavior as desired. And with that said, I think this is a good point to finish off this video.